So, hello everybody. I welcome all of you from the US, from Latin America, from all over the world where you are watching our webinar. And I would like to introduce um, Desiree Whitehead from Dronerts. She will assist me today during this webinar and she will help me to uh, find the right time to answer your questions. Um, let me first of all um, introduce myself. My name is Martin Herkommer. I'm global sales manager at Quantum Systems and I'm working in the survey industry and the geodetic industry for more than 20 years uh, with a long time experience in survey and mapping and also photogrammetry. Um, short words about our agenda today, um, short uh, part about quantum systems, UAVs made in Germany, why VTOL fixed wing, then I would like to introduce, introduce our John F90+, plus, uh, which is an aircraft for, uh, for LiDAR, for airborne LiDAR, and then thereafter the Trinity F90+, plus, which is an easy, reliable, powerful and accurate tool for mapping. Then we would focus on the Cubase 3D, which is our flight planning software, and also the software for post-processing, the PPK processing, the geotagging. And then I would like to show you what else we are doing at Quantum Systems. During my presentation, I will stop my video uh, to have a better performance for the slides and also for the 3D data I would like to share with you. And later for the question and answer session, of course, I would like to uh, start the video again and try to answer all your, all your questions. Quantum Systems uh, was founded in 2015 in Germany and we are mainly building eVTOL fixed wing drones. Uh, right now we are growing rapidly. We have around about 50 employees right now and we self-developed a flight planning software, autopilot software and hardware, and various airframes. The typical multi-copter and fixed-wing systems have contrary advantages and disadvantages. For example, on the left-hand side, um, a copter, an example for a copter, which has a very easy handling, it's vertical takeoff and landing, but on the other hand side, it's a very poor flight endurance and a very slow flight speed. On the right hand side, there's an example for a fixed wing with a high endurance, a high flight speed, but it's very complicated in handling and control and takeoff and landing equipment might be necessary, such as the catapult you can see in the image or for landing a parachute system. So quantum systems, purpose is to create innovative aircrafts that combines the advantage of helicopters and aircrafts. So we have the easy handling, the vertical takeoff and landing, and we have the long endurance and high flight speed. The result, two systems, two solutions, the Tron, the aircraft on the left-hand side, which is bigger, it's a 15 kilogram aircraft, and the Trinity, which is a smaller aircraft below five kilogram. Both with a very high endurance, very easy handling, small takeoff and landing site, and definitely no risky belly landing. So let's focus for the moment on the Tron, which is our aircraft, our UAV for LiDAR mapping. And I would like to show you some details about these solutions and of course, some data. The specs of the Tron, it's a 14 kilogram maximum takeoff weight aircraft with a 20 meters per second cruise speed, a 60 minute flight time with the LiDAR to be safe. And uh, we have 10 minutes from the box to the air. And we cover in one flight in 60 minutes, we cover 10 square kilometers at 100 meter altitude. Uh, the payload for the Tron is two kilogram and we can take off at 8.5 meter per second wind speed on the ground. And during the mission, the wind speed can go up, up to 12 meters per second. For the Tron, we offer two different payloads. It's the Sony RX1 R2, which is a photogrammetry payload with PPK, 
And this is mainly used to colorize the LiDAR data after the LiDAR mission. So we fly a LiDAR payload, which is the yellow scan Soviet Ultra, and we fly a Sony RX1 camera in two separate flights. Therefore, two separate payloads with the same, um, with the same weight and balance. The RX1 has uh, 42 megapixel, and at 100 meter, we have a ground resolution, a ground sampling distance of 1.5 centimeter, a little bit better than 1.5 centimeters. On the right-hand side, there's an image captured in 100 meters, and you can clearly see the details of this tractor. The much more sophisticated payload is the LiDAR. This yellow scan Ultra is the most, so most sophisticated LiDAR in the world, and it fits perfectly to the Tron. In terms of data acquisition rate, so it's a very fast LiDAR system, and in terms of range, so this aircraft can fly up to 200 meters using this LiDAR sensor. So it's a perfect bundle, and I will help you to understand much better why it is the perfect bundle with the next following slides. The Seva Ultra is very lightweighted. It's a 1.7 kilogram total weight of the LiDAR, inclusive the IMU and the batteries. It's super compact, only 18 by 10 by 14 centimeter dimensions. And the maximum range is 200 meter. That means we can fly up to a 160 meter above ground level, which helps us to stay safe of obstacles. At a data rate of 600,000 points per second, we can guarantee a high density of points on the ground, below vegetation, but also on the vegetation. And last, not least, which makes the yellow scan an outstanding product, it's an easy to use one push button equipment. Inside, the Ultra, we are using a Velodyne LiDAR 32 puck class one laser and uh, a highly sophisticated GPS system, which is basically an Aplanix APX15 IMU. And uh, as mentioned before, it's all in one box, inclusive the battery. So there is no cabling between the Tron aircraft and the LiDAR. We just activate the LiDAR before takeoff, we fly the mission, and after landing, we push a single button and we download the data. Inside the Velodyne, there are, uh, the Velodyne is using 32 laser beams, and on the right-hand side in the graphic, you can see we are looking 15 degrees into the flight direction and 25 degrees backwards. That makes sure that we hit a lot of points on the ground, even below dense forest. Later, I will show a project above dense forest and even in the jungle, where you can see that um, the vegetation penetration of this system is brilliant. The system is using up to two echoes, the strongest and the last pulse. And therefore, we can even get a better separation between a vegetation and ground points. The precision of the scanner itself, the Velodyne 32 puck is about four centimeter in X and Y and three centimeters in Z. And the INU quality is about 0.025 degrees in roll and pitch and 0.08 degrees in the heading, which is a um, very good accuracy. And it makes the system a survey grade, a survey grade LiDAR system. The GPS position, PPK infusion guarantees two centimeter X and Y and three centimeters in Z. And due to our experiences and all the flights and missions we have done uh, all over the world, we can say that the absolute accuracy of the system is definitely better than five centimeters. And the new software, the new yellow scan software, using some matching algorithms, some, some matching algorithms from point cloud to point cloud, even increases the quality to down to three or four centimeters. The density of the points versus the altitude is uh, shown in this graphic. So you can see the Tron is flying with the yellow line is flying 20 meters per second. And therefore at 50 meters above ground, we get 85 points per square meter per square meter. 
at 100 meters altitude around about 40 points per square meter and at 160 meters altitude 25 points per square meter. We did some practical, practical trials, some benchmarking um, on our own. Uh, these are flights done by quantum systems near our headquarter. And these four squ three squares are approximately showing the same, same area. On the left hand side at 160 meters above ground, you can see in this area 200 by 200 meter, we get around about uh, 1,120,000 points. This is about 28 points per square meter. Then at 100 meter above ground in the middle, we are still about around 43 points per square meter. And on the right hand side, uh, we have 106 points per square meter in 50 meters above ground. And you can even see a telephone wire cable, which is around about five meter above ground. Comparing these results with the spec sheet, with the yellow scan spec sheet uh, of 2019, we can see that we even uh, beat the expectations. So we are in all classes, we are higher than the, than the specs. And this is for us as a, as a manufacturer for aircraft. It's good to know that we are working with professionals when we offer this um, LiDAR system from Yellowscan. Some application examples, of course, um, it is used a lot for power lines. Uh, this is an, uh, a real data example showing a power line near, near Munich. This power line is 75 meter above ground. And another example I want to share with you today is a project um, in, uh, in Indonesia, in Sumatra. I was helping the end customer to, to do the first missions uh, last year, end of last year. And I think this video might be kind of impressive for you. This is a 2,200 kilometer planned highway in the middle of Sumatra through the jungle and uh, the end customer using the equipment is Futa Makaria. They are constructing highways and they are flying the John and the LiDAR three times a day and therefore they can do up to 30 kilometer per day LiDAR data acquisition. Each time they fly, they fly one time with the RX-1 to get the color information and they fly a second time with the LiDAR. And so the, the productivity per day is 30 kilometers of corridor. So after the mission, the aircraft is coming back autonomously, approaching the landing site. And as you can see here, this is in the middle of nowhere, very small room available for landing. It's stopping in the air and it's descending and performing an automatic landing. Then after processing, um, data has been processed in the field uh, by using the Atlantic software POSPEC to do the, the PPK for the LiDAR. And then uh, the LiDAR data is processed by the yellow scan software in, in the field on a laptop. And then the, the absolute accuracy of data was checked with ground control points. And here you can see the customer is using Global Mapper, and uh, this section of the highway is around about 20 kilometer long. And this was all done in, uh, in less than one day work. On the right hand side, uh, the image can show you the distance between takeoff site and uh, mission and corridor, the corridor mission. And you can clearly see all, the, all they are doing in Indonesia is completely beyond visual line of sight and we are relying on a very nice uh, telemetry system. A second use case uh, quickly shown from, from Germany, um, it's about serving a dense point cloud of a smaller valley, completely different story. It's a small valley where they've been looking for highly precise ground points below trees. 
and the classification of the dense point cloud using multispectral data. So this is uh, the place, it's near the French border in Germany and small valley, it's about uh, 62 hectares. And uh, so the corridor width is 250 meter, 2.5 kilometer long. At 75 meter, we've been flying the Tron. The run spacing 65 meters, three runs, 12 minutes mission time. Result, 36 millions of points. Then with a second setup, we flew the Trinity F9 with a MikaSense Red Edge camera and the Sony UMC. Same area. In 50 minutes, result auto image RGB and auto image multispectral and a digital surface model. This is the flight planning for the Tron done in 15 minutes and the surveying of ground control points for the benchmarking. And this is the flight plan for the photogrammetry mission with the Trinity. Also, the time for creating this flight plan is less than 15 minutes. Then we built up the iBase, which is the base station for the Rhinox data. We started the drone LiDAR flight, which was just a 12 minute flight and the Trinity flight for 50 minutes. And then we stopped the iBase, we download the Rhinox files and from there on it's just data processing. Post-processing, then geotagging, alignment, uh, processing auto image, and then we use the auto image to colorize the LiDAR, the LiDAR point cloud, the last file. And then we had a final result of a colored LiDAR point cloud with RGB and with NDVI data from the multispectral data set. Let me show you a video clip for this mission too. Well, there was a question coming in. The airspeed of the Tron during the LiDAR caption is 20 meters per second. So we are flying constantly 20 meters per second. So this is the flight preparation. Me on the left side, our customer on the right side. We just activated the LiDAR, we close the nose, we upload the flight plan to the aircraft, we quickly design the corridor mapping mission, a few clicks only, and then three runs are planned with, with terrain following. Um, we have a UAV control on the laptop, we do a pre-flight check, we start the engines, yes, and then we press take off, and then we just watch the aircraft taking off. And we can then switch to a 3D perspective, watching the flight on the moving map. But no, in the other, in the upper right corner, you can see a video showing the drone taking off, tilting the rotors forward, and performing the transition. After takeoff, it's climbing, making a left turn, flying a calibration pattern to calibrate the INU, and then it's intercepting the free runs and flying along this valley capturing this LiDAR data. And I will also now show you the live stream of the LiDAR data. There is a so-called um, cloud station, which is displaying the data of the LiDAR in real time, if the customer wants to have that. So here you can see the LiDAR data coming into the ground control station. It's just a quick check of the data so you can see whether you got all the data you need. And you can clearly see how precise the drone is flying along these runs and how nicely the LiDAR is filling up the point cloud. So this live station, as I mentioned, is um, optional. It's not necessary to use this, this live station to visualize the LiDAR data in flight. It's a nice gimmick, a nice to have thing for demonstrations. Actually, you can be sure whenever you plan a mission and you fly, the data is okay afterwards. It can quickly be checked in the field even after landing. So there's no real need using the live station. Yeah, as mentioned before, this was just a 12 minute project, capturing 36 million of points. Then the Tron is going to a circle, 
descending to the approach altitude, approaching to the landing site. You can see the pilot watching it. The task of the pilot is mainly watching. There's usually no interacting necessary. And you just watch the aircraft doing a smooth landing. And this smooth landing is very important for this LiDAR equipment, which doesn't like hard belly landings. So point cloud with all classes, dense forest. Then we remove the forest, we have a medium vegetation. We remove the medium vegetation, we see the very low vegetation in the forest. And once we remove the lowest vegetation, we see the ground points with all terrain details. Seamless data, completely dense data below German forest. And we have a dense forest here. RGB colorized point clouds. Well, there was a question coming from Daniela. We can't use LiDAR and camera at the same time, and it doesn't make much sense because of the angle of view. The LiDAR is looking much wider than the camera, and the camera is too slow to get the real overlap. Here we can see a cross section, also in different classes, ground, non-ground, and vegetation. And uh, here we have the, the slides again with the ground points. We can clearly see the, the details below the forest, in the forest, and we have the low vegetation, like grass, we have the bushes, we have the little bit higher vegetation, and finally the dense forest. Uh, LIDAR with RGB, LIDAR with NDVI, very nice for some uh, more sophisticated analysis. And here again, the LiDAR classes in a cross section. We have an RGB auto image from the Trinity or from the Tron with the, with the RX2 camera. A D digital surface model hill shade showing the forest or without forest. And here you might want to look inside the forest. All these traces here, which you can see in this, uh, in this forest, these are traces from wild animals. I go back to the forest, and here you can see in the forest, these traces inside the forest from wild animals. So the resolution is outstanding. Contour lines without vegetation, tree heights automatically calculated with GIS. In this case, we used uh, QGIS, and then the tree heights above auto image. We did benchmark this with, the, with some engineers from the Institute, the Surveying Institute of the government. And uh, you can see this was the position of the eye base and all the control points are between two centimeters and six or eight centimeters off. Most of them are better than two, two centimeters off. The one with the 12 centimeters in the middle was covered by trees. So actually we think that the GPS accuracy was less than the LiDAR accuracy in this case. Points to remember, drawn with LiDAR is super easy, super efficient, and reliable. What are the John Unix sales points? 60-minute um, flight time with the Yellowscan Ultra LiDAR package, the rise payloads, plug and play. So from, uh, from an RGB camera to a LiDAR, we can swap in less than a minute. PPK and iBase are included in the basic package and we get a better than two centimeter accuracy without any ground control points when working with photogrammetry. We cover 10 square kilometer of LiDAR per flight. We have a easy 3D flight planning for corridor mapping and area mapping, modular design, high wind resistance, and takeoff is easy from any slopes. So we do not need a flat area, we can even take off from a hilly area. Now let's look at the Trinity. 
Um, the Trinity is uh, easy, reliable, powerful, and accurate. Five kilogram takeoff weight, real flight time of 90 minutes or more. The 90 minutes means uh, we can fly the 90 minutes on a full payload, with a double payload, an RX-1 payload, uh, and even with used batteries at cold weather. And the cruise speed is 17 meters per second. Um, we do 700 hectare of area in one flight. The payload up to 700 gram. And the wind resistance is nine meters per second on the ground and 12 meters per second in the air. The wingspan, two meter and 40. The F90 Plus is coming with brand new motors, a flexible landing gear, a various of payloads. There's a new payload selection I will introduce later. We have a built-in PPK, which is our own technology, our own development, 90-minute uh, flight time, and optional, very nice ADS-B out. Uh, it's a real transponder, which makes your aircraft visible for all other pilots. Manned aviation pilots can see your aircraft in the air and also the flight controllers. And when you are operating near an airfield, they can see your aircraft on the radar. Of course, we are using anti-collision lights and uh, we have a very lightweighted transportation case. This is the payload selection right now. We have the Sony UMC, the Sony RX-1, MikaSense Red Edge MX, and the MikaSense Altum for the moment. So the UMC 21 megapixel, then the RX-1 42 megapixel, the Red Edge MX 5-band multispectral, we have the Altum with a five-band multispectral and thermal. And finally, we have the Sony UMC bundled with an Red Edge MX. And here is an example for the UMC payload, uh, 2.6 centimeter per pixel at 100 meter altitude, or the RX-1 coming with 1.29 centimeter per pixel in 100 meter altitude. We can uh, create 3D models, of course. Um, then here is the Red Edge MX, uh, locking the blue, green, red, near, and Red Edge images. The Altum and both cameras, MikaSense, Red Edge, and Altum can also be used with PPK. So the PPK processing is working for all kinds of cameras, and all cameras in our aircraft are plug and play. They are just selected in the flight planning, and then you just plug in the right payload and you fly them and the post-processing is done right after landing within a few minutes. Here, another example from the Altum on a ham field in Germany, then NDVI data, and finally temperature data. Coming soon, the MikaSense Red Edge double payload. This is a blue Red Edge MX and the red Red Edge MX camera bundled like master and slave. And uh, so we come up with a 10 band multispectral camera. And there are unbelievable applications for these uh, 10 band cameras, especially for science. Um, there is, for example, the canopy chlorophyll content index, doable now with the 10 bands, or we can do the modified chlorophyll absorption and reflectance index. This is a real good news for all people working scientifically with remote sensing data. But now let's look at accuracy, PPK accuracy without ground control points. Important to know, we are not using the ground control points for making the results better, just for benchmarking as so-called checkpoints. And this is an example here in Germany um, where we did 745 images at more than 100 meters above ground. The resolution 1.35 centimeters per pixel and roughly covered nine times area all the area was covered with nine images so a high overlap and now let's look at the camera locations um, camera accuracy by ppk mathematically by round about one centimeter 1.2 centimeter in x 1.1 centimeter in Y and around about one centimeter in Z. Total arrow 1.9 centimeter in 3D without looking at the checkpoints. But now we will look at the checkpoints. These checkpoints have been measured with a survey grade um, GPS equipment. And 
here we can see that the X arrow is around about two centimeter Y between one and two centimeters and the set arrow 2.7 centimeters which is a total accuracy in 3D of 3.6 centimeters or just in XY 2.3 centimeters. And this is exactly what, as a photogrammetry specialist, what I would expect from data like this. Um, when we look at the points itself, um, it's uh, quite homogene how the error is spread. And the image pixel accuracy is round about uh, half pixel. So 0 0.3 up to 0 0.7 pixels, which is pretty normal. Now I'd like to show you a short project with Agisoft. This is a, a flight I've been doing uh, together with, with uh, some friends in the US on an airfield in the US in Florida. This is the Vicaria airfield. Um, and uh, this data is all captured in one single flight. And uh, we can see the, the images. So they are quite nice, they are, they are nicely nicely flown. There was a wind speed of about 10 meters per second from the side, so lateral wind. That's why the images are, are inclined to the side. There is a grab angle. The aircraft has been flying with a grab angle. And when we look at the dense point cloud, we can see the accuracy of this data is uh, quite fascinating. We can even see the, the little aircrafts in the, as a 3D model here. These are some Pipers or Chesnas standing on the apron. We have a terrain model, which is quite smooth. And finally, the order mosaic. Um, let's have a short look at a comparison between Trinity and some competition. For example, the Sandsfly a wingspan. We have a much larger wingspan, which makes the flight more stable. You won't see much roll and uh, pitch during the flight. The weight is much more, we are talking about a five kilogram weight instead of a 1.4 kilogram weight, which gives it again more stability. We have a very nice radio link with uh, up to 7.5 kilometer distance and a variety of, of sensors, uh, especially the 42 megapixel sensor is a much better tool than a 20 megapixel sensor available for the EB. Finally, um, the coverage is completely different. We are doing more than 700 hectares in one flight and the flight time with 90 minutes is its own class. And we, of course, we have a vertical and autonomous vertical takeoff and landing, uh, which is some kind of different to a land hand launch or a belly land. What are the unique sales points of the Trinity? 90 minutes flight time, real 90 minutes flight time. Various payloads, plug and play, PPK and iBase included. Complete package below 20,000 euro, including the PPK and the iBase. Modular design, so you can easily change a, a wing on an elevator. Real and fast vertical takeoff. It's, it's, I call it, it's not a mad mic style takeoff, like a rocket. It's easy 3D flight planning. It's a high wind resistance and easy takeoff and landing on slopes. The Cubase 3D is part of the bundle. It's our flight planning software. It's super intuitive and it's complete 3D planning. So it's Windows-based desktop software. For the moment, we are working on other operation systems too to have a solution soon. But for the moment, it's a Windows-based system with 3D, the 3D flight planning and uh, resume mission options. So you can create a big mission and fly it in in uh, single steps with a resume uh, option. We have a very intuitive corridor planning for LiDAR and photogrammetry. And we have the live air traffic uh, display, which is uh, super important when you're operating the aircraft in a, in a dense populated airspace. In the software, we just select the aircraft. So it's the same software, it's the same radio control and the same same procedure for Trinity and Tron. We just select the right aircraft and for each aircraft we can select the right payload. And the payload and the aircraft defines the minimum and maximum speed. And we can set up a link loss tolerance. Uh, that means uh, we define from how long a link loss should be to make the aircraft coming home autonomously when the link is lost. 
This is how the area planning looks like. We can do areas and corridors, either by drawing a polygon or by importing a KML file. And we, of course, use elevation files. Standard is the SRTM data, which is included to our software, but we can also import our own DEM model. That helps, especially when operating the aircraft in mining environments where the where the, um, the terrain is changing all the time, and therefore we can't use old SRTM data, and it's very important to use the recent um, 3D data to have a safe flight planning. We have an altitude profile and a perspective view, and this uh, allows us an accurate estimation of the terrain in flight planning process, but also during the flight. Weather is also implemented to the software, so we have a weather forecast, but also during the flight or before the flight, we can see the wind direction and wind, uh, and wind speed for defining the right takeoff and landing direction. So this is how the wind speed indicator looks like in the software. In this case, the wind from west with seven meters per second uh, speed, and the aircraft is using this information for a better um, performance planning. Here are some screenshots how the air traffic looks like. These screenshots are made near Phoenix, um, Arizona, where we did some flights together with our reseller in, uh, in, in Arizona. And you can see the airspace is densely populated and it's important to know about the aircrafts passing your active, your, your, your survey area in a given altitude. In this case, on the right side, you can see it's 3,575 feet high. And it's no factor for the Trinity being in, in about 300 feet above ground. Post-processing is also part of the software. We select the fly log file from the Trinity or the Tron. We select the right camera. We have an image directory. And then it's just a single button press to do the PPK and the geotagging uh, for all these images by using our base station data or any other Rhinex data or some free of cost data which is provided by the internet, so-called core stations. Well, finally, what else are we doing? We produce some kind of military aircrafts uh, which are used by governmental organizations. This is a two-in-one system, Vector and Scorpion. Two-in-one means the body stays the same, the main body, and we can, uh, we can uh, assemble it with wings or with arms for a copter. So this aircraft can use as an aircraft or as a pure copter, a tree copter. Um, the key facts, uh, it's ready in less than two minutes. One operator, uh, well, it's shock absorbing, it's waterproof, um, it's 120 minutes flight time. It's nicely flying in a 12 meter per second wind, and the weight is around about 6.5 kilogram. The Scorpion is a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, slower, and it's flying 45 minutes, five kilogram weight, and uh, this can hover a long time and is good for urban urban areas. So again, it's a two-in-one system. It's one main body, and you can even either operate it as an aircraft or as a, as a tree copter. There are three kinds of payloads. Um, drone nerds can, of course, send you some more details um, the next days. Um, this is a Nighthawk 2 camera system, or we have two different cameras from Trillium. All of them have their pros and cons, and uh, they, it depends on the application which camera you technically want to use. Optional is a long range ground station, up to 25 kilometer distance for video and telemetry signal, and a tethering system to make the Scorpion technically fly forever, um, to, um, to watch certain areas for a longer period of time. Finally, the backpack. All these aircrafts go into a military grade backpack. Um, to carry the equipment uh, on, a, on your back. So that's it for the moment. And now I'm waiting for your questions and I will start my 
video. So Desiree, can you hear me? Yes, Martin, we have some great questions. Let's start back um, going back in our Q&As to Rich, who wanted to know, he's interested in the use of SAR in rural areas. Is there any more information on IR sensitivity or telemetry? And he's looking for our availability as well. That's our first question. Using, using how good the telemetry will work in urban areas, right? That was the question? Correct. Well, the, we are using micro hard modems and they are certified for a distance of around about uh, five kilometers up to 7.5 kilometers distance. The more Wi-Fi signals in, in the surrounding area, the lower the range. That's the main rule. That means if you are flying the equipment in a rural area, um, technically the range might be even 10 or 12 or 13 kilometers. But in, in, urban, in urban scenarios, usually we get a distance of more than five kilometers, definitely. Okay, great, thank you. And Ayana, if you can just elaborate, were you looking on information on the Tron or the Trinity? So again, Ayana, Norzon, if you can just clarify if you need this information on the Tron or the Trinity. Steve is asking, what is the furthest distance that you can operate the Tron from the drone operator? Um, well, the, the signal, the telemetry signal for the drone uh, in, in rural areas, so for example, in the place in Sumatra where we flew the highway, this uh, long corridor mapping, the telemetry signal worked up to 10 kilometers. However, in Indonesia, there is not much air traffic, especially not 100 meters above ground. And the customer got an approval by FAA to operate it without visual line of sight and without signal. That said means uh, they just deactivated the automatic coming home function and let the aircraft follow the flight plan even when losing the telemetry signal. Therefore, it can definitely operate um, in a, let's say, in 30 kilometer distance from the pilot because you can fly in 30 minutes, you can fly 30 kilometers away, and in the second 30 minutes, you can fly the 30 kilometers back. So the maximum distance, I would say, which is safe to operate a drone is uh, 20 to 30 kilometers. From a legal point of view, especially in Germany, Europe, and the US, it's within visual line of sight. And that means for the Trinity, the visual line of sight is around about 1.2 kilometer. And for the drone, I would say the visual line of sight is about two kilometer. So now let me have a look at these uh, questions in the incoming box. There are so many, uh, so so many texts coming in which are not questions, which are just nonsense. Let me just see. Well, there's someone using Leana is asking about the redundancy of the systems to ensure the reliability. Well, all the sensors are checking each other, so. Um, we are definitely, what is a good thing, we are not using the compass in the air. The digital compass is just used before takeoff. That means in the air, we are not relying on a magnetic uh, compass. We are just relying on a, a pitot tube, which is measuring the speed, GPS, and IMU. And even when the uh, pitot tube is failing, the system will recognize the failure and will go to a defined uh, throttle and to a defined airspeed, which is a safe airspeed, and uh, will fly a, a coming home uh, uh, pattern. And uh, same with all other failures. Most of the failures are answered by a coming home and automatic landing um, pattern. So the main fail-safe system is whenever something is detected, it's coming home and land. Maximum altitude of LIDAR above terrain is asked by Santiago. Effectively, I, I would say most time our clients fly in about 100 meter above ground. This is the, the most used altitude. Therefore, you are 100 meter above ground and about 80 meters above vegetation, above uh, power lines, um, forest, and so on. 
in some cases where it's just about terrain and you're flying about big mines, for example, I would say even an altitude of 140 or 150 meters is doable because you don't need the details from the vegetation from the small branches of a tree, for example. You are just looking at, at the area itself, at the crown points, and then you can fly higher. If it's about power line mapping, the, the rule, overall rule is try to stay about 30 meters above the power line. So if the power line is 60 meters above ground, we would fly 90 meters. If the power line is 80 meters above ground, we fly 110 meters and so on. This gives the best uh, detection of power lines if you are around about 30, maximum 40 meters above the power line. Um, so would you fly a second mission with the... Yeah, Kevin Gonzalez is also asking if he would fly a second mission with the UMC multispectral payload after flying the LiDAR. Yes, that's exactly what we are doing. When, we, when a customer owns a Trinity, he would fly the Tron with the LiDAR and in the second flight, the, the multispectral camera plus UMC or the RX-1 with the Trinity. If the customer is not owning a Trinity and just has the Tron, he can fly a second time with the RX-1 camera to create an auto mosaic and use the auto mosaic to colorize the point cloud. And then Michael Sharon is asking, can this system be used with a regular RGB camera and fixed to a particular moving object to track for surveillance only? Um, well, Surveillance is only done by the vector and the scorpion. I would not say that the Trinity or the Tron are aircrafts for surveillance. They are so-called mapping and surveying uh, tools or aircrafts and um, all kinds of surveillance should be done by a vector or the scorpion. And of course, vector and scorpion, they can move and follow targets. Targets can be automatically detected, they can be followed, they can be tracked. Um, that's all doable with the vector and the scorpion. Mohamed Al Jara is asking what the endurance is with the Sony camera. It doesn't matter what camera you are using on the, on the Trinity, the endurance is always 90 minutes. On the most heaviest payload, like 700 gram payload, we are flying a minimum of 90 minutes. That's the, that's the answer for this one. Then uh, Shashil Kalda is asking how much is the takeoff distance? The minimum, the minimum altitude for a takeoff for a transition is eight meters. And it takes about five seconds from the ground to the eight meters. And then it's performing the transition in a, the next three seconds, which is uh, about a distance of maximum 40 meters. So, five seconds to climb up to the eight meters and then it's doing a transition uh, the next 40 50 meters to do the to go to the to the horizontal flight um, is there any plan for a eoir video payload for your aircraft yes this is done with the vector and the scorpion probably this question was coming up before i was showing these military aircrafts um, then someone is asking, Suresh uh, Moru is asking, can we make place to fit Sony Alpha 7R? We have been using Sony Alpha 7R, but we discontinued because Sony did discontinue the Alpha 7R and we found that the RX1 uh, is the much better equipment, the much better sensor, much better than the Sony Alpha 7R. How many minutes was that airport data to collect? That's Brian Taggart. Taggart. Uh, Brian, this was a 75 minute flight, 75 minute flight in Valkyria airfield. Um, can the, then Leo Herbert is asking if the data can be exported into PIX4D for processing, of course. We are working with Pix4D, Agisoft, Metashape, uh, Drone Deploy, um, Propeller, uh, Trimble Business Center, 
We are with the Stell Air. We are working with all kinds of these platforms. Drone Deploy, any platform can operate with our data. This is just the uh, imagery and geotags inside the imagery. So like meta, meta tags, or you can also have an, a data file having the image names and the, the, the coordinates, uh, the center coordinates and the, the, the pitch uh, and the roll and yaw angles. Um, can we operate in the rain? Um, well, the military equipment is certified for rain. Uh, so Vector and Scorpion, yes. The Trinity and the Tron, you should stop flying when rain starts. It's, it's okay if it's slightly bristling. No worries, it will not fall out of the sky, but you should stop the mission, bring it back home, land it, wait for the rain to stop, and then resume the mission. It doesn't make much sense anyway to do photogrammetry missions and LIDAR missions in rain because the data will not be good for surveying grade uh, processing. Uh, Kevin, Kelvin, Kelvin Gonzalez asking how long it takes to receive from ordering date. I think TrueNerds has equipment in stock, so it should not take long to get any equipment out of, uh, out of the shelf. Maybe due to Corona at the moment, it's a little bit slower, but it should be easy to get our equipment in time. And then Joseph is asking if there's a commercial version of the Scorpion. I'm sorry, there is no commercial version, but it can be used commercially. So it's the same price. That's the bad news. So. The, the Vector Scorpion bundle is around about 200,000 euros, including the gimbal, but um, there will be no cheaper price for commercial use than for a military or defense use. Um, then Brian is asking about launching from a boat. Can the Trinity be hand launched and recovered from a non moving vessel? Of course, you can take off and land on a vessel. And you can also catch it in the air once it is approaching. You can stop it in one meter fifty above ground, and you just grab it out of the air. Uh, oh, there's so many questions. Um, maximum altitude, an interesting one from an anonymous person. Um, what's the maximum altitude over mean sea level at which the drone can perform? Um, the maximum. Tested is, if I'm right, 3,600 feet, uh, meters, 3,600 meters. Um, we just did not test higher. Technically, it should work even higher. Um, our resellers in Chile are operating the Trinity on a daily basis at 3,000 meters above ground, 3,200, 3,300 meters above ground. That's what they do on a daily basis in the big copper mine in the Atacama Desert. Training is provided, Kevin is asking for training, provided by our resellers. In this, uh, if you buy from Tronerts, Tronerts will, will uh, offer the training. And uh, same will do all our other resellers in, in other places in the world, like in South America, in Latin America, wherever you are buying drones, uh, the reseller in this country will provide the training. Um, um, Hi, Martin. I just wanted to also add, we will be sending an email to everybody that's on the webinar, and we will have additional information about 0% financing, as well as all the training that can be done for this product. So yes, we have you covered from purchasing through training and helping you guys get your program set up and flying. Yes. Cool. I see that, that so many questions are, re are repeatedly uh, asking for the same thing. Um, if there's anything I did not answer by now, I, I really can't answer all these uh, 500 questions. Um, um, if there's anything open, please write an email to Desiree um, or to Tronerds. They will answer these questions. If they can't answer these questions, they will forward the question to myself. And I'm super happy to answer your questions, um, either direct or via Tronerds. And I thank all of you very, very much for joining our webinar today. Um, I wish all of you uh, all the best, uh, stay safe, especially in these, uh, 
in these circumstances where we are right now, all over the place, especially in the US at the moment, and my thoughts are with you and the people in New York especially, and I hope uh, time will change and we can start traveling soon and we see us sooner or later in the US or wherever we might meet. Thank you very, very much. Yes, and thank you, Mark, so much for the webinar. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I think that everybody had a great time filled with information. Please, everybody, as soon as you leave this meeting, you will see a survey. Please complete that for us. And we'll be in touch within 24 hours with the webinar's recording. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and have a great day. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Goodbye.